Hello everyone, this is China Paradigm, where we, Dashi Consulting, interview seasoned entrepreneurs in China. Hello everyone, I'm Matthew David, the founder of Dashi Consulting, a strategic research company, and this podcast, China Paradigm. Today I am with two guests. It's very new for me. I hope I'm going to, to handle it correctly. I am with Matthew Bodin, Adri- Adriana Vaderios. I should be with you, Adriana, sorry. Adriana Vaderios and Matthew Bodin. Uh, I know Matthew for some time. Um, Back in Hong Kong, you were in charge of Startup Weekend and Techstars at that time. And it always been, I, I feel, you've always been in the uh, entrepreneur environment, tech and entrepreneur environment. Uh, that's my image of you since since I, I know you. Currently, you are group director at um, Xnode and Adriana, you are a program director at Xnode. So um, it's pretty new for you. Uh, for both of you, your position, I think, is less than three months for both of you. It's basically 2019. It's a new position, 2019. But past, um, previously, you had both been in Asia and uh, in China for some time. Uh, you have observed the market. You have observed uh, entrepreneurs and companies entering China, there's a developing in China or started starting in China. So you have a you have experience which is much, much longer than actually uh, the three months at Exnode uh, witnessing entrepreneurship. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. And the first question I always have for every guest is, what's the size of Exnode? What's the size of, of the business uh, you are working on currently? Size could be revenue, number of clients, number of 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 uh, companies you host. But before that, actually, I didn't explain what Exnode is. Uh, Actually, I, I'm a bit afraid of explaining what it is because I feel I don't understand fully. Uh, I initially, Xnet started as a co-working space. You have now three locations, if I understand. But you are doing more than co-working space. I feel you don't like that we say that that we say that Xnet is a co-working space because you are also offering corporate innovation programs. And yeah, I like to know what it is. Acceleration program, a discovery of China. When I read your your your, your PDF, uh, you say that ch- ch- uh, foreign companies stay in China because they don't know enough about the market, they don't find the right partner. So I feel that what you're providing, that what now you're providing more than just a space and an office. I like to know more about this. So thank you very much again. Uh, I'll let you talk now. What is Xnode and how what's the size of Xnode? Some numbers to share. Okay, so. First of all, an introduction. Um, we have different businesses. Yes, you're right on the co-working space. That was our first. That was how we were born in 2015 as a co-working space. But today we're actually much more than that. And the biggest part of our business comes for, from the innovation side. So innovation, we divide it mainly in two. One of them is our relation, how we help, help startups. We call it scale-up. It's usually when um, foreign startups want to enter the Chinese market, and we help them doing that. Maybe we'll go a little bit more in detail later. And then we have the corporate innovation side, where we have different types of corporate innovation programs, uh, where we might uh, create a relationship between certain startups and corporates, or we might help the corporate to uh, develop projects or business as a startup or in a startup environment. If I may add something, um, so we are indeed anchored in a physical space. We have three locations in Shanghai. We're opening uh, new places in different cities very soon. But what was interesting when you have a physical space is the fact that so many different ecosystem players come and ask you questions about what's going on locally, right? You're being associated as a community leader. And very quickly, what the leadership at Xnode realized is that there is a major need for head of innovations here in China to figure out a way to innovate in the Chinese context. And they often don't have resources from the HQ, who is very disconnected with what's going on in China, but they have that big pain point that needs support. And that's how 18 months ago, Xnode uh, started offering these sorts of corporate innovation programs. But at the core, right, at the roots, what what is in our blood are the entrepreneurs that we see on a daily basis in the co-working space, that we associate with the corporates, and that we have um, uh, during our events. Numbers. I, I I really want to have a bit of uh, a bit ideas on numbers. So I have at least one. It's three locations. 
Could you share more about the sites? Uh, I know people, I know companies which are uh, at Xnode in um, you know, Jinghan. Uh, I don't know the other locations actually. Um, could, could you could you tell us more about some numbers and share some numbers? So we are totally about 65 employees. 40 of them are in Asia, mostly in Shanghai. Uh, and uh, 25 of them are on our joint venture together with High Tech Excel in the Netherlands. Of these 40 people here in China, uh, we have around six, seven of them on a JV with a Japanese partner. We have around seven to 10 people managing the co-working space and the rest, uh, almost 20, are from the innovation programs, both corporate and scale up. I see, I see. Um, in terms of, um, I'm sorry, I, co-working space, I, I cannot, I cannot uh, get rid of this word. Uh, how many how many companies do you host? So we have around 400 startups. Not all of them obviously are in our space in Jing'an, but uh, many of them are in our spaces in Hongqiao or Zhangjiang, which is uh, around the Pudong Airport. Okay, four startups are using your space currently. I see, I see. Yeah, it's much bigger than what I thought. Uh, and <laughs> 20 people, 20 people uh, in, in the innovation program compared to seven, 10 people managing the, 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 the space, that means the innovation program for you now is more important, at least in, from, from a cost perspective, uh, in, uh, than, than the, the pure uh, co-working space. Um, and you mind that, yeah, sorry for interrupting. Ha have in mind that this um, service got started really two years ago, but, but the need is so clear from large corporations that it's taking off and, and the team would probably double within the next two years. Yeah. I see. Very interesting. I'd like to understand more about the innovation program then. Uh, one thing you mentioned, Matthew, before we started, and you, you, you told Adriana we have a lot of buzzwords, and I think that's, that's one of the things during, during the talk we have. I think we will have to define some of the words we are using, like innovation program, or what is innovation, is it discovery of a market, and basically it's a, it's a research and discovery, a trip, or is it innovation of a product? What is really, yeah, what, what do you call innovation, for instance, uh, but other words you are using like scale up um, and, and startup, uh, I know Dave McClure, for instance, has a definition of startup as um, an organization which is not making money, but which is still looking for its product and its market fit. And then it's becoming a company when it's making money. So I, 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 I really um, wish that for the, for the audience and people listening to us, uh, we, we, we know what, what, what the word, what we put as, an, as a definition behind those words. So innovation, uh, innovation program, first buzzword innovation, what do you specifically do? Can you be specific on what you do in terms of innovation programs at companies, some cases? Innovation program. So we have two main lines, as I was saying, the scale up, which I was playing first. This is um, already relatively mature startups from uh, the West, usually Europe or the US. They already have a business case, they have a product or service, and it's validated in their market of origin. And what they want is to come, enter China, adapt their product or service to China, and grow here. That is the scale up. And that is one of our innovation programs. The other part, which is the corporate innovation, um, is usually, as Mathieu was saying, um, foreign big corporates usually, or in many cases, 14, 500 companies who want to enter the Chinese market, but China is a black box for them. They want to either leverage on the technology, the market, or whatever. And we have different kinds of programs, depending on, on what they need, that we will apply. For example, our main ones, we have what we call the outside-in, because we bring startups from outside to contribute and help the corporate achieve uh, their goal. Or inside-out, where we select and scout specific people, competences, resources from inside, and we run it as a startup to achieve a certain impact. Anything else? I see. So, yeah, typically what, what people expect from us, right, is either um, understanding of how to innovate like an entrepreneur, and so that goes through a set of workshops, one-on-one -on -one mentoring session, exposure, 
to entrepreneurs. Some other of our clients are expecting a concrete output, such as a small prototype, um, something that addresses a, a business need, right? So they are looking actually for, for an internal startup that they might eventually spin off. And that also goes through a set of workshops, one-on-one -on -one mentoring and exposure to entrepreneurs. So the what we deliver is uh, typically the same things, but the goal, the objective is being defined together with our clients. I see. How do you charge? So we are still exploring the right uh, revenue model. At this stage, it remains a service fee. Um, and, and that's something that we are comfortable for the foreseeable future. What do you mean by service fee? Is it tailor-made for each of them or...? So the idea is that we, we look at the, at the goal of the program uh, and that we make sure that it aligns with you know, their internal objectives, that we understand the KPIs. And, and, and based on that, we are able to assess what's our value added. And, and this is how we would price our offering. OK. Would you mind sharing your ranges of pricing for the program? So we Yeah, we've seen everything. Um, it would start in the mid six digits up to uh, low seven digits. Talking in GMB? Yeah, absolutely. So basically, you're starting about 15,000 US. So that would be for the, the lighter products, um, like a okay. hackathon and these sorts of things. Uh, but then it can go really high based, again, on the expectations from the clients. I see, I see. And okay. Resource investment from our side. So our programs, some of them, if it's just, for example, scouting to help the startup find specific technology, might last only two months. That would be a little bit shorter than if we do the full-blown five to six months acceleration program. I see, I see. You mentioned the Netherlands. You mentioned... 25 people working in joint venture in the Netherlands, if I'm not correct. What was the connection with Netherlands? I never connected excellent with the Netherlands. <laughs> so that's a very exciting opportunity that happened three to two years ago. Um, high Tech Excel, which is an accelerator, an, an organization innovating in Eindhoven, um, came to, uh, to China trying to scout the market and see if they could partner up with a, a local ecosystem player. And, and Luke, who was sent by this organization and who's now the head of innovation, basically found Xnode to be the right partner to help uh, making that bridge between the two continents and the two countries. Um, and, and basically, High Tech Excel became a shareholder of our innovation programs. And this is how we can tap into their experience, their network, their understanding, and, and we bring the same uh, from China. I see. Talking about your two positions, um, you are program director, Adriana, uh, you are growth director, Matthew. Could you tell us more about your specific positions? What's, what's your perspective in the company? Uh, when you say, do you mean positioning or position roles? Oh, your position roles. So as the growth director, basically what I'm trying to do is find a way um, to add more nodes into our ecosystem, right? We, we, we see ourselves very much as a platform, as a network, which are the two buzzwords. Um, but the idea is to figure out how do we all become stronger and how do we all figure out a better way to innovate here in China? And that takes more and more and more people, more and more and more experiences, experiments, adventures. And my role is to basically give a chance to the team and to our partners to, to, to have these opportunities with us. Adrian? And for the program director, so I am um, in the innovation side, mostly uh, working with the corporates. And what I do is I run the corporates. So tailor them, accelerating, training with startups, giving workshops, uh, basically providing the tools and processes to achieve as much impact as possible for both corporates and startups as soon as possible or as in the shortest time as possible. And then uh, also supporting the growth of Xnode. Uh, with processes and, and strategy and so on. So uh, to, to, to understand better about the pro, uh, innovation program and you, you, you work with, within this, this environment, uh, you are designing the program and then on, once the client is working with you, uh, then another team within the 20 people is working on the project 
Is there one, two people? How does it work on an innovation program? What what can they expect? Or they, they, they have one point in contact and then uh, all the team is working on all the projects. How do you organize yourself? So first of all, we have the content already. We have designed it. We keep improving it as long as we learn. And there is a, only a certain level of tailoring that happens in every project, depending on the needs. Um, usually the way it works is there will be one program director running each program together with a few acceleration managers. It depends, can be one to four, depending on, on the size of the program. And these acceleration managers will work directly either with the startups or with the intrapreneurs, which are the people running um, the programs when, it's, when we are not engaging startups, so the, the people inside the corporate. What do you call an acceleration manager? Would you mind defining it? What is job, a daily job? So acceleration manager, they work very closely, again, either with the startup or with the entrepreneurs to ensure that we have a business model that is aligned with the objectives of the program, that we validate the business model, that we uh, provide the content uh, that the people in the program need in order to achieve, to create a proof of concept, for example, or a minimum viable product, that we have this certain impact that we have promised at the beginning of the program. So they are much more executional. They work together with the people in the program and the program director just oversees. Okay, so the acceleration manager is going to interview people within the Chinese market, is going to uh, reach out to people to introduce to, to, the, to the client. What, what is daily work or is to interact with the client to make emerge actually the MVP and the, the, the business model and so on. Could you be more specific on daily or weekly or monthly work? So the acceleration managers support this. They are a part of all this process, interviewing, creating the business model, but on the sideline. So in the end, it will be either the accelerated startup or the entrepreneur that will, that will manage it. But the acceleration manager ensures that the quality is high, ensures that they have the certain knowledge that they need in order to achieve this, and they uh, guide them in the right direction. I see. I understand. Going back on growth, um, your position as the growth director, you talk about nodes. To, to, to if I'm correct, if I remember correctly, you talk about adding up nodes. I remember that went to X node uh, one year ago, maybe or actually a few times. Uh, because of EO, entrepreneurial organization, because we have gatherings over there. Is EO, for instance, one node for you? One additional node? How, do, could you be specific and give examples of nodes you are adding up now or you are thinking of adding up? It, it, it's really fun that you're, it's very timely that you're mentioning EO because I'm, see, I'm meeting with the Australian branch members um, shortly after this uh, podcast. If we think about it and if we try to, to simplify it, we're on a mission to figure out how innovation is being done in a Chinese context. And for some of your listeners, that might sound like, you know, a no-brainer. It's very easy. Just apply what are the tools that we've learned and discovered from the U.S. But in practice, on the ground level, that's not a satisfying way to really, really innovate with the resources and the people that we have here in China. So with this mission in mind, our goal is to be on the hunt for the right people, the right patterns, the right ways of innovating in a Chinese context. And we have to be very inclusive because we don't know where some of the chunks and bytes of information will be coming from. So EO is probably aware of certain elements that we haven't seen yet, but we're also working a lot with the Chinese government, with universities, with corporations, with entrepreneurs, etc. Our goal is to be as inclusive as possible. So we, whenever there is something that comes to our attention, we're able to capture it and we use it afterward to, to, to give it to everybody. Uh, so there is a, a sense of we learn from everybody and then we share it with that same network. So for EO Australia coming this morning, I will be sharing also what we've learned from, from everybody else, which is a very exciting value proposition for a network. I see. So uh, let's take this example. EO Australia is coming to Shanghai. They go to a new place. I think, I think that's the advantage of having your own place. You can host events. And then after all the companies you are hosting in your, in your, in your space can interact with EO Australia. Uh, after the after the talk, or they can they can they can network with them, they can know them, right? Is it, is it one example, for instance, or interaction? And then you have similar thing with universities as well. 
You're absolutely correct. And yesterday, another example, we had entrepreneurs from Serbia. I hope they are listening to the podcast. Uh, they came to Shanghai. They are looking into implementing um, a branch here in Shanghai. And, and by talking with each other, we've realized that they were not a good fit for our program because that's not what they were looking for. But at the same time, we had heard a corporation, one of the largest car maker who was looking for solution that they were working on the entrepreneurs. And, and we've made you know, the introduction. Uh, so an email was sent and, and, and these are basically two nodes that would never have had a chance to work together. But us being you know, part of that community and actively engaging with it, we were able to create value for these two different organizations. And, and that's what we try to achieve on a, on a daily basis. Um, I, I feel the, what you are describing is what uh, has been expected uh, from chambers of commerce, from uh, other organizations to actually create this environment of network. How do you um, how do you analyze uh, the, the competition landscape? Of course, when we think about the co-working space, we think about WeWork, we think about Naked Hub. Uh, how do you how do you analyze the competition, and how do you think you are different? So, first of all, something to have in mind is that competition is a sign of health in a community. Um, the, you know, because of my previous job, I've been assessing a lot of local communities. And, and the worst thing that you can possibly find is when there is only one player in the market that becomes basically the, the only point of contact for anybody. And this is unhealthy because you don't know what might be happening in 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 that organization's mind. So first of all, having different ecosystem players bringing all of their services, capabilities, and excitement to the table is a great, wonderful thing. So that's the first thing. The second point is the fact that we are at a beautiful place and in an incredible time when we are not looking for market shares. We still haven't realized how big is the pie in the first place. So when... Um, we work is getting a new startup when a chamber of commerce is getting a new corporate partners when when uh, another accelerator is investing in a startup that we could not have access it, we don't see it as we lost a deal because there there is just so much that we could not take care of everybody the other thing and that's probably the third is that um, we have a very specific program so when you think of we work you obviously have a certain amount of a certain ambience, it's a certain network uh, that that we don't necessarily provide, and instead we would focus a lot more on the global, on the local community, uh, with a lot of events uh, that are being run by very different people. Um, and same for corporate innovation, we we found something based on our, all of our previous experiences, and we feel like this program is very clearly de differentiated. Maybe I see. You, you to add there is that there there are a lot of uh, accelerators out there, but most of them in China they are partnered with the government, so they have a different set of KPIs and goals that is not mm. in line with what our customers have always. Moreover, they often stop after putting in contact the corporate and the startup, for example, if I take the, the corporate innovation program, but all the work is to be done afterwards because you need to align the business model. You need to align the goals and you need to bring both of them to the same maturity level or to a, a maturity level where they, can, where they can work. So I would say Xnode has a pretty unique value proposition on, is on this end because our goals are aligned with those of our uh, corporate clients, but also startups. And we manage, we drive the work until we achieve these goals instead of stopping just at, at the networking part of it. I see, I see. One of the differentiation I saw as well from your presentation that you insist at the end that there is no personal equity taken into the company. I feel that differentiation with China Accelerator, for instance, where they will take some shares uh, out of the company. Uh, so basically different models uh, for different situations. You were talking, Adriana, about uh, Accelerator programs with governments. I feel actually they've changed in the name because um, you had a lot of um, spaces, zones from the government to attract for investment, to attract companies with a bit of free space, um, some, some amenities, whatever, and then they are rebranded into Accelerator, but without changing too much of what it is. 
could you mind, could you be more specific on what the government is providing in China and um, uh, examples of, of what they do? You said that they don't follow up; they purely uh, put in contact. But could you be more specific about what 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 you see in the market? So maybe I can jump in here because I have an experience that that's uh, beyond uh, the, the the Shanghai area. So. First of all, it's incredible what, what the government is trying to achieve, right? How do you get as many people in touch with innovation and entrepreneurship? And, and for example, all the programs that they are starting at universities to teach AI is absolutely incredible. When it comes to creating centers or district or high-tech parks, these are initiatives from which the government, I assume, and that, that's just my personal opinion, want to learn what's going on. And, and I'm pretty sure that they are doing a similar work of discovering the best practices and redistributing them everywhere. If you look at Beijing, for example, you have in a way doing a wonderful work with Zhongguan Sun, that, that incredible street where you have a, a, a crazy amount of VCs and, and co-working spaces and every and every ecosystem players like this. You also have Tusk Park that got created from Tsinghua that's doing an amazing job getting into cities where there is nothing and they build the ecosystem from the ground up. And then you have a bunch of organizations like Startup Grind, Startup Weekend, Angel Hack doing also a wonderful job in um, uh, creating kind of grassroots community. And and I assume that, that the government is, you know, throwing experiments in every direction, trying to understand what works. And then as soon as they figure out that model, they will try to ramp it up everywhere. So I think it's okay to have some failures at, at first, um, as long as they keep learning and keep improving. So we are currently working with Zhongjiang, which is uh, one of the largest um, government-backed organization uh, in the tech industry. Um, and what they are doing is fascinating. They They've started as a real estate move, right? Where they open a bunch of tall buildings and then they started attracting large corporations. And then they also bring grassroots ecosystem players like Xnode. And what they hope to achieve is creating a community that they can learn from and, and, and have this being shared elsewhere in China. Would you have some examples of products you have to support it, develop within the Chinese market, uh, which were already existing outside of China and you introduced to the Chinese market through the the programs you have, or uh, a localization you helped, or a discovery which happened, to, which um, uh, led to a partnership or joint venture. Would you be able to share some very, very specific and detailed cases you have, you have been working on? So the fact that I've joined only a few weeks ago means that I haven't been able to sponge all the information from the organization. What I can mention is a program that uh, a startup that we are helping right now. They are from they are from Europe, and they have a solution for um, hotels and and helping the hotels manage with something that I I, I can't remember right now. But um, they are basically bringing that solution. Uh, so they have the tech that has been developed in Europe, and they already found a local partner to help uh, sell that solution. Um, to different clients here in China. Um, I don't know if Adriana, you have another. But you found you found them, right? You so found the partner for them. So that startup found us because they were based in yeah. Europe. They were looking into the Chinese market, so they found us. They came. We were able to um, to um, accelerate them as part of our scale up program, and as part of that program, we placed them in touch with a bunch of. Uh, of potential mentors, but more importantly, business partners. And eventually it worked really well with, with one of them. Okay. How does it work? They have someone here in Shanghai, which is staying at your office or they just come from time to time, or you talk to them over the phone. How does it work? So it's a two months long program. The first two weeks are full time here in Shanghai. So they, they have to come. Uh, and, and we're talking about the founders, right? You cannot send an intern or, uh, or somebody just prospecting expansion. You've got to have the founders because that's what China requires from any startup. Um, and within these two weeks, we hope that you'll get a clear understanding of what you would need. And over the following uh, six weeks, we'll put you in touch with uh, potential business partners. Of course, it's a tailor-made service, right? Uh, mentors, possibly investors. And you can come only once every week, every two weeks, based on obviously the rest of your schedule. But the idea is that every single time that you're flying to Shanghai, and again, the founders, um, you have 
super practical, but also high level conversations with people who can drive your business here eventually. Okay. Adriana, would you have any cases to share? Not for scale up. If you want, I can, we can share maybe one for corporate innovation. Yeah. Yeah, Maybe. yeah. If you can be as specific as possible about what the product is, what you did for them, uh, what's the limitation as well of what you did, because you cannot, uh, you cannot manage a business for them as well. So to understand really uh, in details. Yes, so we were talking before and we decided that we would share one very interesting one that Matthew you knows, Sodexo. So we did a program with Sodexo. Uh, it's a large uh, French company that does a lot of corporate services. And the one that they are very famous for in China is managing a canteen at universities, at, um, at corporate offices. And we've done a program with them where we scouted the market in Shanghai, in China in general also, and we identified a startup. And what they were doing is, you know, when you are at the canteen and you have your tray with some food items on it, you put it under their machine, they would recognize what you've picked, and then they would scan your face, they would know who you are, and based on what you order, they would charge you automatically. Uh, so they so started working on and deploying this solution in some of their canteens here in China. And they liked it so much that they eventually invested 22 million US dollar in that startup, which was their first investment ever in China. Uh, and this is something that got a lot of traction on, on the media and that everybody can, uh, can buy do or Google to to look more for. But basically, without that connection, uh, it's always about that connection, right? But that connection and the support that we provided, Sodexo was able to interact with the entrepreneurs, really understand what they were trying to achieve, and vice versa, the entrepreneurs really understood Sodexo's vision, the business opportunity, and that investment made a lot, a lot of sense. I want to understand uh, precisely. So you found the startup and you, uh, you had them interact uh, between Sodexo and the startup? Yeah, so usually how this works is we, first of all, we start with the corporate to understand their need, their challenge. Then we scout in our network startup, our extended network, I think is over 1 million startups globally. Uh, so we have some tools to make some kind of filtering and so on. We have a, then we, we select a short list with which we have one-to-one -one interviews to see whether this could potentially be of value. And then the final narrow list, about maybe 15 startups or so, we discuss with our uh, with the corporate customer, customer. Usually we select three to five because that's the optimum number for us to add value and run something meaningful. And with these three to five, we assess their, their level and we run them through our internal acceleration program. We provide content. Again, we ensure they have a business model that we can validate and that can add value together with the corporate. Usually the thing we have is that the startup wants to go in this direction and the corporate wants to go in the other direction. So that would never work. So what we do is really understand what can they both do together. We run the startups through the different programs and use in this case, I think, I don't know how many startups were there maybe five or something like that. One of them got this outcome. There could be that there are other projects also maybe a little bit less successful, but still meaningful adding value on other things. Or some of the projects might end up being killed because we see along the program that it will not uh, add to the program objectives. Another concrete example that we can share is the Ask Jerry Challenge. I don't know if you are uh, a cocktail drinker, Mathieu, but um, Pernod Ricard, a, another very famous French um, multinational, um, asked us to basically um, support the startups that were selected for the Ask Jerry Challenge. And eventually two were picked and, and had a lot of support from Xnode to eventually become uh, actual startups. And now they are still thriving. They are still doing a lot of business. I don't know how many employees they have, but I know that they are doing really well. And Pernod Ricard is really excited about this market opportunity that would not have been possible otherwise. So as far as I know, As Jerry is a service which is providing cocktail at home or learning how to do to, to cocktails and also providing cocktails themselves. I'm not totally sure of that. And Pernod Ricard, one of the biggest uh, companies in the world for selling uh, liquors and wine, has invested into these companies. And I I find, I, I remember, uh, they connected to each other through a competition. Uh, were you the guys behind this competition? 
So the company is called Agorize. They are based, they are French, French startup. Uh, they have an office in Hong Kong and, and they were involved in the scouting of the, um, of the entrepreneurs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what, what did you do? You, you worked more on the relationship with Ask Jerry itself? So we did everything after the selection of the entrepreneurs. So making sure that the entrepreneurs get the support that they need, the coaching, uh, the drive, and uh, and we made sure that the... Um, so, so just to step back a little, typically corporations with the processes, the due diligence, with the internal procurement process have a natural mm -hmm. tendency of um, crushing small entrepreneurs. I'm not saying that it was the case for Pernorica. What I'm saying is that large corporations have certain needs and requirements, and and we often act also as the as the translator between the two worlds. Um, so that that might be another thing that we provide to the entrepreneurs. And so for Ask Jerry, the idea was really to manage expectations on both sides. Right? Mm -hmm. How do you work with a multinational, a French multinational, right? Or on the other hand, how do you work with a team? that just got created, right? And they are working on an idea that you gave them, right? So these are all very complex, very human, very personal issues. And that takes a lot on, on our team to be mindful and, and understand and work around. Also, another challenge that we often see is that many of the startups, especially if they are very deep tech, they believe that once you have the technology, you can conquer the world. And there is so much more to it about the team, about the business model, validating the market and so on. So what we provide is this 360 view and help the startup realize that you need to add on to that to ensure this technology can be incorporated or made into a product. Understood. That reminds me what Cate Capital, uh, the investment fund, is doing with some company that in Michelin Value have given them some money to manage innovation. Uh, in some way, uh, you, are, you are doing a similar work, which is to manage, uh, co-manage the startups or help the startup to, 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 to grow uh, that have been invested by a bigger company. Is correct? So it's hard for us to, to talk about Cathay specific activities and, and strategy. We are in touch with uh, some of their partners here in Shanghai, but I would not be able to uh, get into the details of how they run their operations. Yeah, but I, I feel that actually you are also in managing innovation for others. And uh, that's something actually which is pretty, I feel, new over the last decade is to externalize innovation, management of innovation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, going uh, back to to more specific uh, cases, could you tell us how much it is to join Xnode and to have an office? Um, I know you are more in the innovation program, but I, I guess you 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 know uh, those those numbers as well. Um, what what's the budget to join uh, Xnode and to have an office at Xnode? I know there are different offerings, but a range. Yeah, absolutely. So it depends on the location, uh, but for Jingan, it starts at. Uh, 2,500 genminbi a month for a desk, uh, which is your desk. You don't, you don't have to just pick a random one every morning. You have one desk with one uh, locker. Uh, you can also use it against another fee for um, a business registration. And then we can go from that specific desk up to uh, a closed office of, of 30 people, I think. And I'm not too sure for the budget of that one. Okay, you don't have hot desk offers. No, we don't have a hot desk. Okay, so two thousand five hundred. It's about um, it's about three hundred three hundred fifty um, US. Should be around this. Yes, absolutely. Per month. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Um, I like now to to talk about your past experience. Um, as as we mentioning, Matthew, uh, I know you since uh, since you were in Hong Kong, and you have always been involved into the entrepreneur entrepreneurial um, uh, ecosystem. And um, I like to go back in time and you had been what we call entrepreneur in residence at WeWork Labs. You, you mentioned several times that we, you use a lot of buzzwords in your, in your uh, in, in industry. Uh, could you tell us what is entrepreneur in residence? Absolutely. So WeWork Labs is a, is a fantastic program that WeWork started a few years ago, originally from, um, from the US. And the Shanghai um, Nanjing Silu WeWork um, created the labs. Uh, they were the first one in China. Um, and, and the concept of a lab is to create uh, a community 
with more ecosystem players. Um, so in that lab, you have the entrepreneurs, of course, always at the center, but you also have a large corporation, some mentors, and some events. Um, and so the idea of the entrepreneur in residence is to be a potential mentor that, that's very often available to the entrepreneurs part of that lab. So again, the mindset of creating connections. And so concretely, what I was doing for the entrepreneurs part of the Nanjing Sidu Labs is sitting down with them on a regular basis and you know, asking them the questions that hurt a little so they, they get to think from a, a different perspective. Um, and, and but now, why entrepreneur in residence? Because there was nothing and you had to create the, the, the business? Why, uh, I, I, again, we're talking about buzzword, entrepreneur resident. Isn't it another word for just manager? Well, we, we would have called like 20 years ago a manager or a, um, um, a manager of a unit, or, which is just very new and to create. What, what is the definition of entrepreneur residence? It's an excellent question, and the reality is that it varies a lot based on uh, organizations. So, for example, at Techstars, an entrepreneur in residence might be concretely involved into one project that we deliver for clients, but it can also be somebody that thinks about broader strategies with a certain angle. At the WeWork Labs, an entrepreneur in residence is somebody from the local ecosystem who can plug that ecosystem with the members of the labs uh, while uh, bringing mentoring um, so it might have a different definition in the U.S., but this is how I was perceiving the the, the volunteering role um, on Nanjing Silu. Uh, it was not a job; it was a volunteering thing. I see. I see. Um, talking about uh, other experiences within within the with entrepreneurs, um, now I think it's pretty famous. Um, you have been uh, in, involved with a Startup Weekend. Uh, I say it's pretty famous because on, uh, when I was in Beijing like uh, eight years ago, I participated to one startup weekend and I was very, very happy with it because it helped me to connect with developers, with designers and so on. Uh, could you tell us more about what uh, Startup Weekend is? Um, is it um, um, a for-profit organization? Is it a non-for-profit, a non-profit organization? I know there is a trademark and you need to ask for, for, to use that, for the name. Some people are not aware of. Could you tell us more what, what's behind Startup Weekend? So Startup Weekend is a 54 hours event that help people uh, get connected with others, as you mentioned, uh, learn how to create a project from the ground up, and third, uh, get a chance to validate their ideas, okay? It's not a startup manufacturer. It's really just a platform for people to discover the fundamentals around, again, meeting somebody, testing an idea, or learning the first few steps. Um, startup Weekend is owned by Techstars. Um, Techstars is um, a worldwide network that helps entrepreneurs succeed. It's based out of Boulder in Colorado, and it runs a bunch of different programs to help entrepreneurs grow to their next stage based on their level of development. And Startup Weekend is very often considered as the first step towards innovation. And Startup Weekend is being run with in mind to not make a profit. Ticketing is only to reimburse the costs of running mm -hmm. an event. Mm -hmm. If there are sponsors, is to make sure that the event is slightly fancier than what it could have been. Startup Weekend are being run by volunteers that we call community leaders uh, because they often are really well plugged into their local community. And, and the mindset is really um, to create an opportunity for more people in their local city to um, have a chance at being an entrepreneur. Um, it works only because people are willing to give their time for free, the organizers, but also the mentors, the judges, and with the support of partners. And it's working very well because this format is simple and resonates with any culture. There are Startup Weekend in over 160 countries. Um, one of my most memor memorable Startup Weekend was in Bhutan, where we had 140 students from all universities across Bhutan uh, coming together and, and, and creating projects the same way people do it in, in Shanghai, in Mumbai, in Paris, in New York, and in LA. And this is a very, very exciting organization to be a part of. I see. I see. So it's owned by Techstars. Um, so it's leading to the other question about what Techstars is exactly uh, in the ecosystem of services for entrepreneurs. 
you have Startup Green, you have EO, you have Xnode, but I know I'm very clear on what Xnode is providing, but I'm not very clear on what Techstar, Startup Green uh, are, are providing and what, what the difference is. And I might not mention the, uh, many other organizations which has existing. Still, uh, Startup Weekend is very famous. So Techstars, I think, has a very specific place in, in, this, um, in this environment. Could you tell us more about what Techstars is doing, how, much, uh, how they make money as well? Because actually we understand a lot by how companies are making money, but really what they do. So could you tell us more? Sure, certainly. So Techstars got founded in 2006 in Boulder, Colorado, in the U.S. So it's not a Silicon Valley um, company, which is a very interesting thing, by the way, because Techstars sees itself as um, not the Silicon Valley model where you try to attract everybody to you, right? You try to have the best entrepreneurs, the best mentors, everybody. Techstars mindset is that we need to open an accelerator closer to where you're comfortable creating a business. And we need to create the environment on which you can be successful. So Techstars runs accelerator program. It's very often considered as the, the, um, the organization that structured what an accelerator is. Um, and then they open source the concept and that's why there are accelerators all over the world. But basically you have a three month program where 10 startups get selected. They each receive investment. 20,000 US dollars for 6%. They also have access to 100,000 US dollars convertible note. And during this three month program, they can uh, have access to hundreds of potential mentors and business connections. There is a strong focus on growth. And at the end, they get prepared to raise additional money during a demo day. And Techstars core business is the one of investment. They have... Um, they have invested in over 1,700 startups. It's actually one of the largest early stage investors in the U.S. Every five, one out of five startups in the U.S. get an early stage investment through our Techstars Accelerator. And it, it's becoming a very exciting value proposition because now that there are 47 Accelerator and, and the goal is just to add some more in different locations, their network is also uh, growing exponentially fast. Okay, this is for profit, right? Uh, we started weekend is not for profit, but textile is for profit, it's privately, privately owned. Absolutely, yes. Okay, understand. Very interesting. Um, then uh, textiles would be more in the light of China Accelerator in China. So I would almost say the other way around. Yeah, yeah sure. Sure, text started order for sure, for sure. Okay, uh, I understood. What, what are the differences you've seen so far between Hong Kong, where you lived, uh, Shanghai? I, I saw that you have also organized events uh, in other in, in other countries. Uh, you mentioned uh, Macau. You mentioned Taiwan. Um, you 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 may mention other other places you have been. So typically, when I look at Hong Kong, I'm, I'm thinking of an amazing and incredible market to test something new. It's a small market where it's very easy to reach out to your customers. It's extremely simple to raise some funding and the legal system is simplified for you to operate at an early stage. The, the problem is it's only a 7 million people's market. So eventually acquiring new customers is going to become really expensive and Hiring, you know, dozens of developers is going to be a headache. And, and that's when Shanghai is absolutely incredible. Uh, you have a 22, 24 million people city, very close to other exciting markets that are thriving. And, um, and it's also a, a Chinese market. It means that every six months you need to start from another blank page and rediscover what people care about, how do they consume. And this is absolutely incredible. When it comes to Macau, we were extremely surprised and so impressed by the quality of the individuals that we've met over there. It's, a, it's an ecosystem that's very early stage, still very much focused around the hospitality industry, but they also realize the challenges of being focused in one direction only, and they are now developing entrepreneurship as one of their potential um, next industry. I see. Uh, Adriana, we didn't talk too much about your past experience, but you have been involved in uh, solar energy, in renewable energy. Uh, could you tell us uh, what's your perspective in China about this industry, about renewable and solar energy? Do, do you feel that the momentum is still on? 
we know that China has bought a lot of solar um, and uh, actually wind uh, turbine in the past. Uh, what's your perspective on the market in China? Yeah, so uh, actually my experience is in wind, but uh, really okay. in general, uh, China is the first consumer of all kinds of energy uh, right now, even nuclear and gas. So there is a huge demand. Actually, half, uh, almost half of the worldwide installations of wind last year were in China. So yes, there is a huge development. Uh, whether this is very much related to innovation, I wouldn't say, because the Chinese um, wind energy and, and to a certain extent solar as well, they, they are relatively new. So they are catching up on the European, on the Western way. So we need to first catch up to a certain level because before we can innovate. So it, I would say still, a, and that's also one of the reasons why, why I left a pretty... Um, traditional uh, immature um, industry. Uh, what I really like about it is that in China specifically, things happen so fast that what took in Europe 30 years to build, we are doing it in China in less than 10 years. And that is extremely exciting in that sense. So I would see China and Asia catching up to Europe in the next few years and maybe even um, surpassing them. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's close to close to, to one hour. We've been pretty efficient. You're a good speaker, that's why uh, you are used to it. Uh, so thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed uh, the talk and thanks everyone for listening. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Take care. Bye.